The Story of Me is brought to you by Layuna Ontario Provincial District Council. Layuna, feel, feel the power. power. Hello, he lived through three wars, a devastating business venture and a family tragedy, but he is still standing. Call it belief in himself, persistence, courage, and faith. No matter what, our guest is a true survivor. Let's welcome Lee Wu Kun. Hello. Hi, how are you? I am well, and you, you look well as well. Thank you so much for being here to share your life story. Right, okay. You are, were born in South Korea. Right. In Seoul. Right. Big city, huh? Big city, yes. Yeah. St then was a, already a big city, right? Right. Yeah. Um, now, your father was born in North Korea. Right. Your mom was born in South Korea. I guess in those days, there was just... One Korea, right? Right, there was only one Korea. Yeah. So there was free movement right. back and forth. Right. Okay. Um, now, you went to school in, in Seoul? Yes, I was um, in school, uh, grade school. Yeah. Uh, my age, eight. Yeah. So it was 1944. I engaged school, first year, and and continue. Then 1945, the Second World War is ended, right? Well, it was ended. So you did um, go to school, primary school, while uh, World War II was still going on, eh? Yes. Do you remember anything about that? Yes, we have to uh, speak Japanese and Japanese language and the writing. Yes, that's what they teach. They yeah. not teach our uh, history either. Oh, you had to speak Japanese? Yes, one year, during 1944. Uh -huh. And one year, after one year, that was 1945, the Second World War ended, so... Yeah, that's right. But, but then, just five years later, the Korean War started. Yes, Korean conflict, yes. Uh, between the North and the and south. south, and you were around 13, 14 then, right? I was 12 years old. 12. Yes. What memories do you have? Uh, in a previous conversation, you talked to me about some bombing from airplanes. Can you tell me a little bit about those memories? As the bombing, um, actually, um, when the Japanese steer in Korea, 1944, tier 45, yeah. and I remember how B-29, they come through Seoul, Korea, the, and sky. There's many flights comes in. Yeah. Then we all have to be evacuated and hit the foxhole. Yeah. Hi. Oh, you remember that, eh? Oh, yes. Me and my grandma, whole family, every time uh, B-29 comes in, but they never drop any bomb in, in Seoul, no. No. And I also saw... So uh, you're talking about World War II, right? Right. Yeah. But then the Korean War. Oh, uh, Korean War. Uh, that was that was more dangerous for you and your family, right? Yes, that was 1950, uh, June 24th. And I was, uh, we have in Seoul, the center of Seoul, we have streams. Then yeah. we, I was out there and playing with my friend. And we saw with the, the uh, fighter plane, which later I realized, airplane comes so high, I mean, so low. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe about maybe uh, at least about hundred meter between the ground. Yeah. The so low. Yeah. They came right through the two flights. Then uh, we would wave our hands, you know, see, because we never see the airplane that close. Yeah. Then we, later, I noticed that that was North Korean flight. Then June twenty five, they attacked front line, 
they came down. Was your family affected? Uh, we haven't known any problem. They didn't shoot anything. They just. You, you once you told me about uh, your uncle's house in Seoul. Was it burnt down? That was uh, after 1950, during the war. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, July. Yeah. July between July and August, the Americans they have to yeah. drop the bomb, night yeah. bombs, and yeah. the whole city. So everything burned out. Yes. Yeah. And and was your father in in the war? My As a father, soldier? No, my father was uh, worked in a, a, a trolley company, the street car. Oh, so company. he was working. He was working. Yeah. Yes. Did you attend school during the Korean War? During the Korean War. I was uh, in high school, yeah. first year of high yeah. school, and everything breaks up, and we, we have to evacuate. You have to stop. Right. Ah. Uh, do you remember being scared? Uh, or, or did you have, did you feel safe? I always scared that family apart. In, in, I hate to lose my family, I mean, yeah. parents. Yeah. So that's the only thing I always stay with the family yeah. closely. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, like even, you know, fighting, I, I never scared, no. No. Okay. Uh, but so your family was safe, uh, pretty safe, uh, and it survived the war. Right. Uh, do you remember when it, the store was, uh, sorry, do you remember when the war was, was over? Yes. you remember how you felt personally? Or? Uh, well, a lot of this was a lot of damage. There was no house. I we know. had to move him back and forth, many different places to go, go, because my father, he has to get job in different area. Yeah. And that's the only thing I had uh, concerning. And yeah. the rest of them. You know, we just live like uh, just as a survivor. That's right. You you are a survivor <laughs> of that particular Very war. Uh, you told me that you didn't go to school during the Korean War. Did you do anything? Did you work? Oh, so that case, uh, my brother, older brother, he went join Air Force. So nobody helped family. My father. Father is the only one who worked, and that's not enough to support. I have three brothers un yeah. under the me, yeah. so I had to work. And uh, what did you do? Uh, I went to uh, uh, institute the driving course. Oh yeah, to get the license so I can work. Oh, as so, a driver? As as driver, yes. But in the, my age, I was only eighteen. Yeah. So. 17, 18. 17, you got your driver's license at 17. Yeah, when, see, we have a little, uh, the police headquarters, they are operating a, a driving school. Yes. And they teach you uh, uh, electronic and the bodybuilding, you know, they teach you about, all about automobile. Yeah. So I, got, I learned a lot of experience from that, uh, that was very unusual for a 17 year old to get a driver's license no? right and i'm the youngest one <laughs> just getting very good and, and and then later on um you used your your knowledge as a driver you um um one of your first jobs with was with the american company post exchange yes also known as px uh outside of seoul how did you get this job Oh, I have my, my brother's uh, friend who works in the area. Uh, we, we had, the, I remember, they had the, this community, uh, they hiring people. Okay. The office. Yeah. And uh, my brother's friend, he introduced me to the chief. Okay. Then I. So it was through your brother, right? That you got the job. Now, did you speak English? Because this is an American company. Did you speak English then, or or no? No, I I cannot speak English. No. 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 
So you just drove, and how did you, did you not have, oh, was your, so your boss not right. English speaking? No, after the, I was the learning to drive in school, yeah. and all, all those time, yeah. I had to learn myself, you know. So I have a little, little um, I learned a few words. Or a few words, yeah. right. Okay. Uh, now in 1959, you served in the Army for 32 months. How was the experience? Uh, did you have any incidents with North Korea? Was there any, any problems? Okay, my MOS is infantry. Yes. 110 number. Yeah. And uh, I was, we have trained, basic training. After then, they sent, uh, we used 110 is infantry MOS. So uh, when they break down from uh, after the basic training, I was lucky. And I went to uh, Second Army uh, down South Korea, way down south. Oh, way down south, not yes. by the border with North Korea. No, not in the okay. front line. Okay. Yeah. Now, in '64, you married in yes. South Korea, uh, and then, and the, in '69, you returned to this American company. I guess after the army and getting married, uh, you returned to Post Exchange, where you worked for 33 months. Uh, but this time in Saigon, during another war, right, the Vietnam uh, War, another right. war to contend with. Any scary moments in Saigon? In Saigon, yes, I was always scared because what they call VC, yeah. Kong, and they they we live together with them anyway. Yeah, because they are always the underground. Yeah. Did you? Did you have to uh, to hide? Did you have to? Was there a lot of bombing that you had to uh, try to escape from? Okay, so, so here's to remember. I remember that the first day I get off uh, U.S. Army Second. I mean U.S. Army First Division headquarters. Yeah, yeah. it was airstrip, and we landed. We I went through um, uh, one thirty cargo plane. Then right after I hit the ground, we see they shooting the rockets. Rockets keep coming in. But I remember uh, the Korean conflict. I was little, even, I was a little boy. I remember uh, everybody said anything like uh, any bomb drops, just hit the ground, don't move. Don't run, just hit the ground. Right. That's, I remember that always. So uh, uh, when rockets comes in, right after get off plane, it keep coming in. So I hit the ground. The ground is so hot, you know, almost burn my my hand. Yeah. But after it finished, then uh, we went to our barracks and take the stuff. So by 1969. You were still a very young man. You had already gone through two wars and then one more, so it's three wars. Uh, did this experience with these three wars affect you in any way? Uh, the way you thought about life? Um, how, how did it affect you personally? Uh, I remember. I'm, I wasn't Christian. My family is Buddha. My uh, part of my mother's side, a grandma. Yeah. She's uh, one of the uh, uh, Buddha. The yes. High class Buddha, yeah. I'd say. Then um, the day I hit the ground in v Vietnam, when the rocket comes in, somehow I say help from. I ask God to help me. I want to. I want to go back home after this trip. So please let me survive. You know, let me arrive. Arrive. So it, it's worked because in Vietnam during staying in Vietnam, so many times they shoot the rockets. I had to hit the ground 
Yeah, so you're saying that times. faith in God may have helped you, huh? Right. I didn't even believe God, but I say, God help me. I want to go back home, you know. The first day I say that. So this then, is uh, where you're in face of death? That's how your faith in God really started, eh? You think? Uh, then uh, I, I'm pretty sure right now God enlisted me. <laughs> After then, I have to come back from a Vietnam yeah. to home. Yeah. And uh, was, I think it was during, it was 1973 or 74. Mm -hmm. And I really got into a uh, full gospel church. Uh, religion. Yes. Uh, now, after the war, uh, in 72, um, you left PX to work with the U.S. Army for four years. Then you worked as a library assistant. Where, where you told me before you learned English, uh, a little more English, and you worked for an American company, Berman Buckskin, for 18 right. years. But at the same time, you had your own business. You became uh, uh, an entrepreneur by marketing leather garments as well as making plastic moldings. Uh, so you became... Uh, an entrepreneur, uh, quite a big change in your life, eh? Because oh, you yes. had worked with, uh, for other people. Right. All of a sudden, you have your own business. Right. How did I, this happen? This leather business in Korea, they gave orders to big a trading company. A big trading company, they have the whole leather garments. There's many different items to, to contain to their business import export business. And they all, they give what the, the order they get from Americans and Europeans in Japan, and they gave that to the sub factories. There's many sub factories they, who are making rear garments to, for them. They make the contracts, right? So I was working with them and, you know, I'm not greedy about the as my experiment, so I might as well just, you know, get myself set up a little factory. Oh, okay. So, uh, see, a 12 machine, sewing machine can make uh, one perfect garment all put together. Mm -hmm. so, so one machine makes linings and one machine makes, you know, sleeve and all this. Mm -hmm. So I learned from them how to make the leather garment. So. I asked a trading company. Of course, I had a little uh, license to run the uh, factory. Yeah. So uh, I got order from uh, the big company. Yeah. And they gave me orders. Because, and that's how it started. Right. That's how I okay, started. Okay. Now, while you were um, uh, doing this, you visited China to China. set up a leather garment factory there. Uh, you also spent two and a half years in Guadalajara, Mexico, to teach the production of leather garments in new factories. So you did, you were doing well, eh? Right. Your business was doing well. Right. I'm doing, you know, I don't have to stay because I hired the technicians and yeah. they would take care. Yeah. And also my wife yeah. also helping, yeah. yes. So, in 1992, you immigrated to Canada. Now, with so much going on in South Korea, you were fully employed, you were a successful businessman, and you came to Canada. How come? Because, uh, let's say, uh, my wife was running those plastic molding uh, business. Yes. And uh, at that time, it was 1989, we survey in, in China, my com Berman Buskin. Actually, the Berman Buskin, they merged to a Wilson yeah. Leather Suede yeah. in the United States. Uh -huh. There's a leather garment export. We had about 600 outlets yeah. in the United States. And in Korea, now those um, uh, making charge, wages keep going up. So. My company, they're seeking new spot yeah. to in, in China. But how come Canada? Why did you move? Because uh, 
after uh, in China, we had set up, everything runs fine. And that time, my wife, she had her friend who lives in Canada. Here, yes. okay. And that she, my wife's a friend keep a Canada is good, you know, you have all this work <laughs> you had, so you can come to Canada, do some business over there, yeah. can be, you know, can and be better. And that's how, uh, how it happened. That, that's that how it happened. So I come yeah. back, I've been running back and forth, and uh, one day she told me, hey, I have all the documents set up and ready to go. Okay. So I was surprised, you know. I had the plan to set up a business in, in yeah. Guadalajara, already sent the machines. So you had to leave everything behind, eh? Yes, leave uh, everything behind, yes. You, you wanted to be nice to your wife. Right. <laughs> She's been working hard. Yeah, I'm That's sure. That's right, right, right there, see? She, That's right. She's strong. <laughs> she. So are you. Um, now in Canada, you had two Coffee Times franchises. Right. And this was quite an investment for you, huh? Yes, we had four hundred thousand dollars invested. Invested. That was, eh? Yes. Uh, this franchise in Canada, you must understand, uh, which out of control. More, I would like to say, because they don't care how much you invest. Yeah. They just. They just. Now I understand that uh, these uh, two franchises, this business, went bust. You lost everything. Yes. Can you tell me briefly what happened? Well, like uh, one of, uh, I have at the, the Lawrence Mall, your income, your sales, say uh, $30,000, you have to pay t almost $10,000 your uh, uh, rent fee, and just no way you can continue. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I asked the head office, I want to get off. Why can't I even get off? They off. just... Because, because, because you had a contract. 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 Yeah. Apparently you lost everything, uh, even your house? Even my, I had to sell up my house two times. I tried to reduce. Yeah. And it's gone. Everything gone. Oh, God. And yes, uh, you told me also uh, previously that uh, your wife, uh, who had some that illnesses, she, she may have died of stress caused by this, right. by this business failure? Right. Are and you convinced that that's what happened? Yes. Uh, so that make her uh, have high blood pressure and uh, uh, diabetes. Yeah. And the diabetes and high blood pressure caused her even she had to cut her legs too, surgery, operation. But you survived. How did you do it? Again, was it faith in God or something else? Yes, faith in God. And I were praying hard, but still it doesn't, you know, it doesn't give us a better business. Yeah. You keep going down, keep going down. Yeah. But you didn't give up. You went back to work. Yes, because uh, I mean I don't want to give up. I mean I, I can't give up, and I got a lot of things to do. <laughs> Aside from these events, uh, in 1998, your only daughter died at age 20. 20. Yes. She went. She asked me to. My wife hide uh, her passport. And she, she got to go to see somebody, and she said she'd be back. So I get, I let her know where the passport is. Yeah. Then after then she never come back. So she had gone for a visit to South Korea. Yes. Yeah. And and she died from some kind of diet medication. Yes. Uh, how did this affect your life? Well, you know, everything, you know, that make bring me down. I mean, I, I don't know what to do. And I asked, I prayed hard, 
and pray hard, hard. And that's and helped you. Of course, that through all me. of these uh, tragedies. It, it, um, now that, you're you're you presently live with a son, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and you've been a widower since uh, 2013. Um, it sounds as if faith, religious faith, faith in God has really helped you through. Um, and as you mentioned, you converted pretty well from Buddhism to Christianity uh, during the war, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, but you also told me a story about a friend who left a Bible <laughs> in oh, yes. your room, right. uh, probably on purpose. Uh, and that's how you started reading the Bible? Right. Yeah. Uh, at that time, did your wife convert as well? Yes, of course. She yes. did. Uh, now, you um, have gone beyond just being uh, a faithful person. You're, you're actually working in a church. Uh, that's the um, uh, Resurrection Pentecostal Church, right? Right. What do you do there? See, well, you have a role there. I know. I know that you. You're not just. Uh, you just. You just don't attend church. You. You're doing some work for the church, right? More like uh, church didn't ask me anything, but somehow automatically it's happening. So I just. I just do it like. Uh, you're carrying Bible over to the China, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And also, um, like, um, uh, you pray for yeah. somebody that sickness people especially, yeah. and they get well. Yeah. You know, things like that. It's I understand a very you're miracle. also an elder at the, uh, yes. at the church, which means you, you what? You take care of church operations and... Well, actually, uh, elder business is uh, to uh, pray. The God give us a, a pray yeah. to the sickness people, yeah. or the people who have a, uh, a problems. Yeah. And also, uh, say, uh, the people who not believe God, and pray for them yeah. to be in the Christians, yeah, to save, yeah. So that that's our job. Yeah. Now, since December of two thousand and twenty, you acquired a half hour show, Freedom and Faith. We have a little picture here of you in studio. Uh, it's a it's a TV show. You do you do what? Reading and preaching. Preaching, reading, yeah. yes. What's your, uh, what's your main message? What do you tell people out there? You just, you read the Bible, but you also preach. What is your main okay, so actually, message? Okay, uh, so um, my speech, my, my main goal is, I know when I'm preaching Wednesday at 2 p.m., that means, uh, see, I, I, I always pray for mainland China. We have there's many Koreans who live there and many Christians, they're underground. That was even 30 years ago. Yeah. Now I understand they have, the government give more pressure that if you cannot even, uh, what they call it, internet systems. Yeah. They cannot go through. But I understand this web, go live TV. Yeah. If they know, yeah. The, the so web. you pray for them. Yes, I pray you for pray them. You pray for them. In yes, China. I just I announce it. Say, it, this is, especially this is oh. uh, preaching for the mainland China. China. And uh, I pray that you continue your mission. And I want to thank you for sharing uh, the story of your life with me. Have a great day, and thank you so much for, for being here with me. You're welcome, yes. And we thank the viewer and say goodbye. See you later.
，拜拜。